Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats. Good afternoon. Uh, members, we are still in announcements. Are there any announcements? Seeing none, orders of the day. We have a little change in bill order for you. Members, there is a new amendment to House Bill 829 that recently went out in your email. So we will start with, at, right at the top, with House Bill 657. We're gonna skip 829. We'll do 871, 879, and then we'll come back to 829. All right. So with that, we are starting with House Bill 657, which is an act relating to the modernization of Vermont's communications, taxes, and fees. Prior to third reading, the member from Clarendon, Representative Peterson, offers an amendment to the bill that the first assistant clerk emailed to members at 948 this morning. This amendment is also posted on the House Overview webpage, and paper copies are available at the main table. Member from Clarendon. Uh, my amendment does a couple things to the uh, amendment offered by the member from Burlington on Friday. Um, in section 13A, uh, 2B, large B, there's a statement in the bill, uh, a per linear foot fee for, and it said, digital subscriber line, coaxial cable, and fiber optic cable as follows. What my amendment did was take out digital subscriber line. That refers to copper cable, and my thought was that that's unclear. The best thing we could do is take it out of the bill. Uh, and down in large C, and I know this is scintillating, I've been told it's scintillating, but, but follow me here. Um, Large C says all other communication property, and then we added except twisted pair cable shall be subject to a fair, reasonable, and undiscriminatory fee schedule established by the Secretary of Transportation. So that all is the first instance of amendment to get rid of digital subscriber line and allow the charge to be filed against coaxial cable and fiber cable only. The second instance of amendment is in 13A uh, 3E, which is the exception section of the bill in that section, that accepted, made an exception or exemption for power utilities not having to pay the fee. But I add, unless it is used to provide broadband internet access services defined in 3BSA, section 348D1, or is leased to an internet service provider for such purpose. That was added because power companies can run their own fiber optic, offer services offer, or lease their services to other internet providers. They are not an internet service provider, they are power company. And I felt it fair to do that. The committees graciously, both uh, 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 Environment and Energy and uh, Ways and Means heard my amendment and both uh, voted on it unfavorably. So I'm going to withdraw the, I'd like to withdraw the amendment, Madam Speaker. Uh, absent objection, leave is granted. Prior to third reading, the member from Craftsbury, Representative Sims, offers an amendment to the bill that the first assistant clerk emailed to members at 11.39 this morning. This amendment is also posted on our House Overview webpage and paper copies are available on the main table. Member from Craftsbury. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as you just heard, um, we appreciated the conversation with um, the member on his amendment. And while we decided not to move forward with that amendment, we did really appreciate the members flagging for us a question about terminology in the bill. He really helped us identify that DSL, Digital Subscriber Lines, is a service that is offered over twisted pair cable lines. And that if our intent was to really focus on the infrastructure, to describe the inf infrastructure, that um, twisted pair cable is actually a more accurate term. And so um, we are offering an amendment to swap the language in the bill that says digital subscriber line and replacing that with twisted pair cable. Um, and our committee had a straw poll vote on this amendment, which we found favorable 903. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Craftsbury? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have amended the bill. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H657, an act relating to the modernization of Vermont's communications taxes and fees. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Now we'll turn to House Bill 871, which is an act relating to the development of an updated state aid school construction program. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H871, an act relating to the development of an updated state aid to school construction program. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Next is House Bill 879, which is an act relating to the emergency emergency temporary shelter program. Prior to third reading, the member from Rutland City, Representative McGuire, offers an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Rutland City. Madam Speaker, yes, I offer an amendment. It's a very simple amendment. It's just adding a representative appointed by the Vermont League in city and towns to the um, shelter program task force committee. Thank you. Member from Report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and we thank the member for his collaboration and continued um, dedication to this issue. In a straw poll vote, we found the amendment favorable on account of 812, and we ask for the body support. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Rutland City? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have amended the bill. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H879, an act relating to the Emergency Temporary Shelter Program. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? Member from Rutland City. Madam Speaker, I, I, I want to start by letting people, and there's many in this well that know what I do every day when I'm not up here serving my neighbors and serving the constituents of Rutland and Rutland City. Folks, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak strictly from my observations of the current program as is from the lens of Rutland from my lens. I am in the Cortina Hotel weekly. Every Monday I am down there doing the best I can 
to apply relevant services and help those individuals down there access the necessary services to get them out of the circumstance of being in a wretched environment. Babies are being raised in these environments. They are growing up in these hotel rooms. Our most vulnerable are being exposed daily to drugs, human trafficking, and violence. People are dying in the hotel rooms. The, there are no kitchens. There is no living space. We are concentrating our most vulnerable, impoverished, and disabled people in the buildings not designed as permanent housing. Why? Why are we burning our money in this way? Again, you are looking at an individual who spends his days at these locations when I'm not in the position of operating a transitional house. I believe in this work, but with all due respect, this is not my work. This is not my work. This is not my program. Except, what about Rutland? What about Rutland? What about Rutland City? It's just warehousing. They're out of sight, out of mind. And this is all being brought down in Rutland, and we are doing the best we can to help that vulnerable population. Going forward, again, why is my community being asked to take on this social burden of hundreds without the proper staffing, oversight, simply because we have more empty hotel rooms in our, in our county? That's literally what it is. This is not how an equitable program should be designed. There is no premise behind this program, none at all. This is another poor response to the homeless population. This is a poor response to our vulnerable population that needs our guidance, that needs our services, that need this oversight, that need to find adequate and appropriate measures to address why they're there and us to have that affordable housing. And here we are constantly putting more money into something that's not working. It's not working. What else could we be doing with the money? What else could we be doing with the money? What is actually a progressive policy here? Why are we building more housing? Why are we doing it faster? What about removing the regulatory barriers incentivizing construction so that those babies can grow up in real homes? I'm blessed just like many others who have the privilege of just having a granddaughter that's gonna grow up in a home. But I think about those babies that have been born and raised in that hotel for four years. In the environment that is, that is currently going on in that environment, it's despicable. And for us to be able to sit there and say that this is dignity, please define for me dignity then. This is an injustice and it has to change. There has to be a better model. There has been many, many suggestions made that could get us on out of this, but they were completely disregarded. Instead, we took a historically what worked GA program with the supplemental congregate, removed it and replaced it and defaulted back to the hotel rooms. It's not going to work until relevant services, accountability of ownership, reasonable responsibilities put on both state hotels and participants are implemented. We are going to continue to house, warehouse our most vulnerable population. I am pleading with this body now, please reconsider this measure, reconsider or at least reconsider putting in the appropriate guardrails and implementing relevant services for the individuals that are in that need to participate in. Please, thank you. The question is, shall the bill pass? Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, much of what uh, the previous member spoke of, uh, I can say that probably everybody in this body agrees with 100%. The focus of this bill is to create some uh, guidance for situations where people find themselves without anything. Um, and absent having this temporary emergency shelter program, people literally be sleeping in their cars or in tents or along the roadways of Vermont. And that's, that's the truth of what happens uh, day in and day out. 
And I'm not going to stand here and defend the hotels uh, for some of the conditions that they have had. This bill makes it clear in state statute that they have to abide by Public Accommodations Act and um, that there will be penalties imposed if they do not. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is we do. We do have a plan forward, and that plan forward is being considered in H-829. That is the plan forward that we have to construct appropriate shelters that come with supports and services, as well as additional housing for the state of Vermont for the people that we are speaking about here. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we have to have a response that is humane and protects them from the elements here in the state of Vermont. And this is what this bill does. And as we, as we are able to advance more affordable housing in this state, are able to advance more appropriate shelter space in the state, then we will be reducing our reliance on these hotels. And that's uh, a day that I wish will come very soon. Um, but it takes time to do these things. And that is uh, the main focus of this, is to have something that will be a fail safe for individuals when they have no other place to be. So I urge the body to support this bill. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill pass? Member from Granby. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have an acquaintance that I was speaking to the other day, a gentleman. 42 years old, single, living in a homeless shelter. And I said, what do you do during the day? And he said, nothing. There's nothing to do. I watch TV. I sit around. There's no place to go. So I said, well, what's going to happen when um, this runs out? And he says, I'm going to go and live with my uncle. So. The picture I see is this is someone who has a place to go, who's taking advantage of the system, who has no quality of life that I'm sure would love to have a quality of life if someone gave him a hand up and not a hand out. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill pass? Member from Chittenden. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I too have some very serious concerns about the direction we're going. No one wants to see someone who finds themselves homeless without a roof over their head. And perhaps we have a responsibility to do all that we can do with shelter capacity. However, this bill puts language in statute, not the language, it's similar to the language we put last week in the budget, uh, which is session law. This puts it in statute expands the program. Additionally, Madam Speaker, I tried to find out um, how many of the folks that are in the hotel program come from out of state. Madam Speaker, we don't know how many come from out of state because we don't ask and I arguably we can't ask because of some court rulings. So we, in a different type of way, have put out a welcome mat that you can come here Say you don't have a home or an address, but you plan to stay in Vermont, and we will provide you a hotel room. And I just, we all want to help our neighbors, but I'm not sure this small state of Vermont can afford to be house everybody in the Northeast that wants to come here because they find themselves in circumstances that are unfortunate as big a heart as we have. So Madam Speaker, I will be voting no on this bill. Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, I rise in solidarity uh, with the member from Rutland. Um, Bur Burlington has also bore the brunt of the housing crisis like, like we're hearing in Rutland, where people were warehoused, I think that's a good word to describe it, in motels. But we saw in Burlington what happened when they were kicked out of the motels without a proper plan. And within days, hundreds of people um, in the streets, in the woods, stor uh, um, stories about assaults occurring to the people, you know, vulnerable people. Um, 
I, and so I, I want to express support for the committee's work because without this safety net, it's, it's going to get a lot worse. But I also want to, to join the voice of the member from Rutland in calling for us to move faster and to do more and to stay focused on ending the housing crisis. Uh, we, need to, we need to stop throwing people out into the streets with oxygen tanks. We need to stop sending people out who are blind, wandering around at night not, with, with nowhere to sleep. We, we need to not be kicking vulnerable women out to, to be further abused on the streets. You know, we really need to give people the support of housing they need to heal and to recover and thrive. And I also want to challenge the misconception that there's some kind of um, mass wave of people coming to Vermont to take advantage of our luxurious hotel program. That most of the people, I've worked with unhoused people in Vermont for 25 years, and pretty consistently, the majority of those people are former DCF kids or people with disabilities or mental health issues who have been abandoned by a system that ended institutions that used to care for them without ever properly building the community care that they need. So the, the exception I would say is I met a surprising number of transgender refugees who have come to Vermont after being driven out of southern states, and it's not that many. I, but once again, this is just my perception, but I think it's important to share it because I don't think that our hotel program is that attractive. And, and in the end, we need to build the housing and, and you know, stop fighting about the temporary solutions and, and find some agreement on some permanent ones. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill pass? Member from Pulteney. Madam Speaker, when the vote is taken, I request that it be taken by roll. The member from Pulteney requests that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll. Is the member sustained? The member is sustained. When the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. The question is, shall the bill pass? Member from Essex. Madam Speaker, no one is arguing that our most vulnerable individuals should stay in hotels or motels indefinitely. I think we can all agree that that is not a long-term solution to this problem, to this crisis that we are facing. But because we haven't had a plan for the last four years, we have had to do something to keep these people safe. These are our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, our family members, and we need to keep them safe. We have a long-term plan that we are working on. This is a short-term solution to a crisis. Crises mandate a, a response that is not often the most reasonable thing to do, but here we are. So to say that we can't support this and to turn our back on our family, friends, and neighbors is not the right thing to do. I support this bill. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? Member from Middletown Springs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the question of, of how we provide for our <clears throat> fellow residents in Vermont uh, has been obviously really troublesome and very divisive. And the plan that we've been using was cobbled together, was amended, was you know, definitely uh, had a lot of problems. Changes to it have had a lot of problems. Um, we talk about needing to end the whole transition out of the hotel voucher program. Um, we talk about dignity and that the hotel voucher program is not providing dignity for people. Trend, moving them out into emergency shelters will provide less dignity. Um, what we need is housing. That's how you provide dignity to people, is by housing them permanently, not temporarily, not in a, uh, a building built for another purpose. And we haven't had a coherent, cohesive plan. Now we do. I'm sure it will evolve over time, but the key to it is building housing. This is the plan, this is the bill that lays the foundation for that plan for progress forward, ultimately for housing, 
for treating people with dignity and respect. And Madam Speaker, I will be supporting this, uh, this bill because this is the path that I see forward to achieve those goals. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? Member from Morristown. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> I have a history of being vulnerable with this body, and I will do so again now. As a person that has lived in my car, in Vermont winters with a child. As a person that has utilized the hotel voucher program, it saved my life. It is not a permanent fix. It was an unpleasant experience. However, it was temporary. I will say we need a better plan. I will say that I am the result of what happens when people have access to the support services that they need to transition into sustainability. I would not be here without that. Vermonters should have the right to have access to temporary housing, transitional housing, permanent housing. And although it is not the best solution, the purpose here is to keep Vermonters alive. And only for that reason, I will be supporting this bill. We need a better plan too. The question is, shall the bill pass? Member from Westminster. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to speak in support of this bill. Last year, when the initial uh, GA program ended up having a transition where I think about 800 individuals were transitioned out in June, I was there talking to individuals as they left the hotels, and I ended up working for the next six months or so for a uh, organization that worked with individuals who were unhoused. Many of the individuals I worked with were people who had been exited last June, and many of them did not find housing. Most of them did not find housing. Some of them were lucky enough to get to stay in the overnight shelter, and many of them were sleeping in sleeping bags in the cemetery or in a tent in the woods or sometimes sleeping on a bench somewhere in Brattleboro, and that is not acceptable. Are the hotels a good place for people to live? Not really. Is a hotel better than having nowhere to live? Absolutely. And while this is not a permanent solution, there are tools in place that we are looking at this session that are gonna look at the bigger range picture. What can we do to provide longer term housing solutions? We are gonna get there. But until we get there, I don't want any more people going out in the woods and sleeping in the cemetery. So please support this status that we need as a stopgap measure until we have more housing. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, will the clerk please call the roll? Andrews of Westford. Yes. Two minutes.
Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats? Will the House please come to order? I would like to remind members that we are in the middle of a roll call vote. Members and guests are prohibited from using computers, phones, or any type of an electronic device. Please refrain from the passing of notes and conversation during the roll call. And when the clerk calls your name, please answer in a loud and clear voice so that the clerk can accurately record your votes. The question is, shall the bill pass? Will the clerk please continue to call the roll? Andriana of Orwell. Anthony of Berry City. Arison of Wethersfield. Yeah. Arsenal of Williston. Yeah. Austin of Colchester. Yeah. Bartholomew of Heartland. Yes. Bartley of Fairfax. Beck of St. Johnsbury. Yeah. Burbeck of Winooski. Yes. Byrong of Regens. Yes. Black of Essex. Yes. Bloomley of Burlington. Yes. Bongarts of Manchester. Boson of Westminster. Yes. Boyden of Cambridge. Yes. Brady of Williston. Yes. Brannigan of Georgia. Brennan of Colchester. Brown of Richmond. Brownell of Pownell. Brumstead of Shelburne. Yes. Burdett of West Rutland. Yes. Burke of Brattleboro. Yes. Burroughs of West Windsor. Yes. Bus of Woodstock. Yes. Campbell of St. Johnsbury. Yes. Canfield of Fairhaven. Carpenter of Hyde Park. Yes. Carol Bennington. Casey of Montpelier. Yes. Chapin of East Montpelier. Chase of Chester. Yes. Chase of Colchester. Yes. Chestnut Tangerman of Middletown Springs. Yes. Christie of Hartford. Yes. Chena of Burlington. Yes. Clifford of Rutland City. Yes. Coffee of Guilford. Yes. Cole of Hartford. Yes. Conlon of Cornwall. Yes. Corcoran of Bennington. Yes. Cordes of Lincoln. Yes. Tamar of Enosburg. No. Demro of Corinth. Yes. Dickinson of St. Albans Town. Dodge of Essex, yes. Dolan of Essex Junction, yes. Dolan of Waitsfield, yes. Donahue of Northfield, no. Durfee of Shaftesbury, Elder of Starksboro, yes. Emmons of Springfield, yes. Farley's Rubio of Barnett, yes. Galfetti of Barrytown, no. Garifano of Essex, yes. Goldman of Rockingham, yes. Ghostland of Northfield, no. Graham of Williamstown, Granning of Jericho, Gregoire of Fairfield, no. Hango of Berkshire, yeah. Harrison of Chittenden, no. Hedrick of Burlington, yes. Higley of Lowell, no. Holcomb of Norwich, yeah. Hooper of Randolph, Hooper of Burlington, yeah. Houghton of Essex Junction, yeah. Howard of Rutland City, yes. Hyman of South Burlington, yeah. James of Manchester, Jerome of Brandon, yes. Kornheiser of Brattleboro, yes. Kresnow South Burlington, yes. Labor of Morgan, no. Labalty of Linden, yes. Lally of Shelburne, yes. Lalone of South Burlington, yes. Lamont of Morristown, yes. Lanford of Regens, La Rush of Franklin, no. Levitt of Grand Isle, yes. Lipsky of Stowe, yes. Logan of Burlington, Long of Newfane, yes. McGuire of Rutland City, Marcotte of Coventry, Mazin of Thetford, yes. Matos of Milton, no. McCann of Montpelier, yes. McCarthy of St. Albans City, yes. McCoy of Poultney, no. McFawn of Town, no. McGill of Bridport, yes. Mahali of Callis, yes. Minier of South Burlington, no. Morgan of Milton, Morris of Springfield. Yes. Morrissey of Bennington. Rowicki of Putney. Yes. Nicole of Ludlow. Yes. Nod of Rutland City. Yes. Noise of Wolcott. Yes. Nugent of South Burlington. Yes. O'Brien of Tunbridge. Yes. Odie of Burlington. Yes. Oliver of Sheldon. Page of Newport City. Yes. Payala of Londonderry. Yes. Parsons of Newberry. Pat of Worcester, 
Pearl of Danville. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to call it again. Pat of Worcester. Pat of Worcester. Pat of Worcester. I'm sorry. I'm having trouble. Thank you. Sorry. Pearl of Danville. Thank you. Peterson of Clarendon. Pouch of Hinesburg. Priestley of Bradford. Quimby of Linden. Rachelson of Burlington. Rice of Dorset. Roberts of Halifax. Samus of Castleton. Sackowitz of Randolph. Shy of Middlebury. Shaw of Pittsford. Sheldon of Middlebury. Sibelia of Dover. Sims of Craftsbury. Small of Winooski. Smith of Derby. Squirrel of Underhill. Stebbins of Burlington. Stevens of Waterbury. Stone of Burlington. Supernana Barnard. Taylor of Milton. Taylor of Colchester. Templeman of Brownington. Salino of Brattleboro. Tooth of St. Albans Town. No. Tory of Moortown. Yes. Troyano of Standard. Yes. Walker of Swanton. I'm sorry, Walker of Swanton. No. Thank you. Waters Evans of Charlotte. Yes. White of Bethel. Yes. Women of Bennington. Yes. Williamsbury City. Yes. Williams Granby. No, this Wood of Waterbury. Yes. Andriana of Orwell, Anthony of Berry City, Hooper of Randolph, Lanfer of Regens, Marcotte of Coventry, Morgan of Milton, Oliver of Sheldon, For purpose of explanation, member from Westminster. Keeping people sheltered in hotels is not an ideal way to provide housing, but providing hotel rooms when Vermont, for Vermonters when other options are not available is an essential policy to protect and preserve lives until better housing options can be developed. Member from Richmond. Madam Speaker, I voted yes to support this bill as an established plan addressing how we provide shelter and services for our most vulnerable com community members. Member from Northfield. Madam Speaker, I cannot support the significant expansion to our existing rules that this bill places into statute. Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, as a housing and services provider for young adults transitioning out of homelessness, I support H-879. It meets one part of the state's obligation to ensure that when homelessness occurs, it is brief, rare, and non-reoccurring. Member from Bridport. Madam Speaker, I voted yes on this bill because all Vermonters are worthy of dignity, respect, and compassion. Until this body is ready to truly commit to resolving homelessness and ensure all Vermonters can thrive, this bill is the bare minimum in upholding our oaths of office. Member from Castleton. Madam Speaker, between a poorly run program and no program, we're effectively left with no good options. A rock and a hard place. It goes without saying, the hotels need significant oversight and need to be preserved for those who actually need it as temporary housing options, not full-time residents. Member from Winooski. Madam Speaker, I vote yes for the dignity of unhoused Vermonters. At a time when it takes the average Vermonter over 200 days to find permanent housing, this program provides time and services to support some of our state's most vulnerable people, rather than throwing them out onto the street in 28 days. Member from Burlington. I voted yes on this bill as it applies values and purpose to the work we do. We should do all that we can to ensure that Vermont is a place where all can not only live, but where all can be safe and thrive. 
and member from Granby. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Instead of blaming the governor for things that are not working, maybe it would be more productive to work with him. Let's start working as a team instead of pointing fingers. This is four plus years in the making. It is way past time to fix homelessness and far, far too much money that could have been spent on permanent solutions. Member from Rutland City. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I voted Madam, yes. Member this. from Rutland City, do you wish to explain your vote? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Thank you. I voted yes on this bill. Nothing is perfect. I visited a motel in Rutland, deplorable. Mold in the laundry room, which had to be closed. Seeing children in the hallways is heartbreaking. The administration has had over three years to come up with a plan. How many houses could have been built during that time? Thank you. Member from South Burlington. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. We are all in this body one bad day away from needing this program. Member from Bennington. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Madam Speaker, this bill provides temporary shelter between 45 to 90 days for families with children, people with disabilities, and others experiencing catastrophic situations while establishing a long-term vision for emergency temporary shelter. I believe this is the least we can do for our most vulnerable Vermonters and vote yes. Member from Rockingham. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Madam Speaker, I voted yes because housing is health care. Member from Morristown. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. I want to apologize to Vermonters for having to brunt the financial burden of the expansive program. And although not physically sound, it is all we have. It is not the best solution. It costs so much, and I wish there was a better plan to sustainably house Vermonters, especially our most vulnerable population. Humans are not disposable. I hope the people in these situations tap into services and find their way to, sustain, to a sustainable lifestyle. Members, please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 105. Those voting no, 37. The ayes have it and you have passed the bill. Just a reminder for members about bill order, we're coming back up to House Bill 829, and then we'll resume with the order at 874. So with that, we'll, can the House please come to order? Next is House Bill 829, which is an act relating to creating permanent upstream eviction protections and enhancing housing stability. Prior to third reading, the member from Winooski, Representative Small, and others offers an amendment that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Winooski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members will find the amendment to H829 on page 3008 in today's calendar. Um, I will say that the amendment before you today is very straightforward. Uh, when I came in this past biennium, Madam Speaker, my focus was on addressing the, the excruciating impact of evictions on the people in my community. Uh, evictions are a devastating, uh, destabilizing event for too many of Vermont's families, especially when it comes to no cause. No cause evictions and their allowance in our statute essentially opens the door for blatant discrimination. Um, people can be evicted simply because they weren't the right fit. It means that landlords do not have to give a legitimate reason for why someone's housing is being destabilized. 
And so since we have not taken significant action and have not been able to pass the charter changes that my community has overwhelmingly supported, um, I put forward to the uh, body today an eviction moratorium on no-cause evictions. I want to be clear that this does not prevent a landlord from evicting a tenant. It is simply saying that landlords must have a reason before evicting a tenant. And it goes on to further call out the specific pieces of our eviction statute currently in place, um, which will stay in effect and which ones will not. And simply what this removes is the opportunity for a no cause eviction, whether there is a written or unwritten agreement. The second part of the amendment um, is legislative intent that we as a body are going to come back and address this issue, um, that we recognize that no cause evictions should not continue in the state of Vermont, and we will give uh, means for landlords and tenants to have a me uh, mediated repair moving forward. I think what stands out to me most, Madam Speaker, is not only the no cause evictions that I have heard from my constituents in the past three months, um, had 10, 10 constituents who have been no cause evicted due to landlords moving in um, and buying up properties and jacking up rent and therefore pushing them out. But I think what was most touching was um, just grabbing lunch last week and having our very own line cook um, come forward and say that he himself is being no cause evicted. And sadly, this will likely be his last year serving here in the state house, serving us all such delicious food. Um, and we can retain people in Vermont if we gave them due process and better protections. And so I hope that uh, the body will help support um, the eradication of no cause evictions here in the state of Vermont. Thank you. Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the representative, one of the sponsors who was able to um, come to our committee last week and discuss this amendment. Um, eradicating no cause evictions is a major policy change and your housing, your general and housing committee has um, discussed this in committee. We had a bill earlier this year, H616, that touched on this and like most any conversation between those who own the properties and those who live in them, it was um, a very difficult but short conversation because the complexity involved with ending no cause evictions in one part of the state and not extending that uh, throughout the whole state was a very difficult um, concept for us when we try to do statewide uh, statutes. And so we heard the arguments before us um, we had a very lively conversation about it and appreciated the time spent in committee and your your general and housing committee felt that this was not the right amendment at this time and we voted it down six to four. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others? Member from Winooski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the previous member acknowledging the testimony that was taken um, on a similar uh, bill before the committee and recognizing that there is action that is needed um, in, in relation to no cause evictions. Um, I do just want to remind this body that during the pandemic, we put a moratorium on no cause evictions. We recognized that people were being pushed into homelessness um, and that it was costing us significantly in the hotel rooms because of folks being pushed out. Um, we just passed a bill that addresses the other issue of our uh, temporary shelter program and yet are not addressing the no cause evictions. I think what is really what stands out to me most is the recognition that when the no cause eviction moratorium that was in place during the pandemic um, discontinued, we saw no cause evictions rise by three times the rate prior to that of the pandemic. We see that this is an issue in our communities. It is something that we need to address. And without just cause eviction in the communities that have passed those charter changes, um, this is the action that I see as most important before this body today. And I ask for members to please support. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others? Member from St. Albans City. Madam Speaker, this amendment as the member from Winooski said, 
relates to charter changes that are in your House Government Operations Military Affairs Committee. We spent a lot of time last biennium working on a very robust series of guardrails to try to implement the Burlington Just Cause Eviction Policy. And we were unable to be successful in that in the end. And there are similar charter change bills for a couple of communities in our committee. We took some testimony about that last year in this biennium. And I think it's really unfortunate that we haven't been able to find a clear path to giving those communities the policies that they want. I'm not 100% sure that given the changes in housing policy, in the judicial system for trying to move evictions for cause, um, that those are really the right policies for those communities or that an eviction moratorium or no cause eviction moratorium as this amendment puts forward is the right policy. We haven't vetted those policies. And we haven't done that for a number of reasons that are both policy and also politics. And I've been very transparent in the conversations I've had with other members about some of the challenges that we have around moving those charter bills forward. This amendment does not solve the problem that we can't move those policies forward. This amendment would impose a policy with very little vetting, very little testimony against our committee process on the entire state that probably isn't the right policy today. So I'll be voting no, and I hope that we can continue this conversation and that we continue to support good housing policy that does help solve the problems that we have with the housing market, but this amendment does not do that. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others, member from Burlington? Madam Speaker, I just wanna take a brief amount of time to make sure that the body understands the process, and there's that word again, that precedes this amendment. Um, so town meeting day 2021 was March 2nd, and I that was well before I had any intentions or inkling that I might be on this side of the discussion. But I do remember voting for uh, the Burlington Charter Change for Just Cause Eviction Protections. Um, I was excited and happy to do that. Um, prior to that vote, I just wanna talk about the processes that happened to lead us all to this question, this amendment. So prior to that happening, a large number of Burlington residents got the number of signatures to submit to the city council and to ultimately be on, 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 on the ballot for, for question. And I will say that that was a fairly good turnout. 64% um, of the folks voting voted to pass the just cause protections. All eight wards in the city of Burlington voted to pass. Prior to that, with the city council, this gets to the vetting question, um, it, it went through a very rigorous committee process. It was passed by three committees by, by a majority vote. And then this, it, it was placed onto the ballot by a 10-2 bipartisan vote, independent vote. Uh, so six P's, three D's, one I. Since then, Winooski has passed a similar charter change by 70% of the votes in 2022. Essex passed one in 2023. Montpelier just passed one this past town meeting day. So the voice is growing, right? This, this, this is direct democracy at its finest. This is the people from these municipalities saying these are protections that we need in place. And I appreciate, my, my predecessor worked hard to usher that through to the next set of the processes. And I appreciate the, the work that all of you who were here during the last biennium 
to try and pass that through. And I know it, it was heartbreaking for all of us when we saw it, the, the override missed by one vote. And many of us were watching that. Um, this is a new biennium, right? And, and I feel very strongly that charter changes are kind of a no-brainer, that we have an obligation to take them up. And I'm surprised that we haven't done that again, especially given the company that Burlington now has, from Winooski, from Essex, from Montpelier. The former rep from Burlington, who is now the mayor of Burlington, has been continuing that work as recently as two weeks ago, trying to convince this body that we need to take this up. And we're kind of repeatedly told that we have to wait until we develop a statewide policy. And I, I, I think I would be incredibly supportive of that. And I think that's, that's a perfectly sound explanation for why we might want to pause on charter changes. But then we're also repeatedly told how hard it is to develop a statewide policy. And that leaves these four charter changes just kind of sitting there. And I think, I don't think that's right. So this is where the process leads us. When the residents of Burlington are asked to wait three, more, three years to have this body validate their democratic process, we are pushed to implement a temporary moratorium on no-cause evictions until we can resolve these clear calls for, act, from, for action from our municipalities. Um, and I, 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 again, this is an obligation, right? Um, we are obligated to our constituents and they are speaking very clearly that they need these protections. And if we're not gonna pass statewide policy, um, this, right, this, this seemed like an appropriate bill to place this amendment onto. This is the bill that purports to create permanent upstream eviction protections. And there's precious little of that in this bill. And this amendment is temporary until we can get a statewide policy in place. I do urge my fellow reps, and I know it's a difficult vote, from Burlington, from Winooski, from Essex, from Montpelier, and the entire body to support this amendment. And Madam Speaker, I will ask that when we vote on this amendment that we do so by division. The member from, when the vote is taken, it will be taken by division. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others, member from Waterbury? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to spend a little bit of time um, sharing with the body some of the work that your general and housing committee did, has done with respect to evictions. And I, this, has not to, this has nothing to do specifically with charter changes. That's in another, that's a purview of another committee and I won't speak to those frustrations that those communities may feel. What would happen if this amendment made it all the way through and was signed into law, not just passed today, but what if it was signed into law? Besides taking aside the fact that it probably wouldn't. If this were law, it would upset, again, the protections that are in place now for both landlords and tenants. And without putting one group in front of the other, the, the point of our work is to find those balances where we can find the, 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 tech, the, the pieces here that make it both humane when it comes across as, as when we see some, the inhumanity of, of no cause evictions and our public policy to try to end that right up against the private property rights of people who own these buildings. And the reason why we don't think this works now is because we're going to find that if people, if this is mandated upon property owners, property owners can own buildings in any community across the state. And so there are plenty of landlords who own properties in Burlington and in Essex and in Winooski and in Montpelier who own buildings elsewhere. There are tenants who have lived in all of those different places at different times. We're already told that our statutes regarding landlord tenant law 
are outrageously difficult to follow, or they're hard on people, or they're not fair. This would disrupt the relationship that exists between a landlord and a tenant to the degree of, of chaos in my mind, where people who are moving or people who own buildings wouldn't know what law appealed, uh, what law was meant for them or not. That is not to say that the committee hasn't worked on it. And that is not to say that the committee won't work on it in the future. But just to say that this is not the time or the place right now to put this policy in without having an incredibly difficult, lengthy and nuanced and complex conversation about what it means to own property in the state and, lend, and rent it out and what it means to be a tenant and have to rent out buildings. And so I'm asking this body to um, support the committee on this and vote no. And there is a further amendment down the line that we'll, we'll discuss um, next steps. And I'll leave that to the, to the um, sponsor of that amendment. But again, I would just ask that the body stick with the committee and vote no on this amendment. Member from Middletown Springs. Thank you. Um, when uh, the member came to, uh, to offer this amendment to the committee, uh, it was very compelling. His arguments were very compelling. And uh, I believe that the, the committee is, as a whole, is very is sympathetic to the, uh, the need for resolution to this issue. Um, and, uh, and also to the frustration of having spoken clearly in a democratic process and feeling that your voice is not heard. And uh, I understand that frustration. Um, my challenge with having a, implementing a statewide system on a, uh, a floor amendment is that in my district, I'm hearing exactly the opposite argument. I've had nobody talk to me about the need for uh, no cause, preventing no cause evictions. I have heard repeatedly that the system is out of balance favoring tenants over landlords. So completely different story in a different part of the state, which illustrates the complexity of making a statewide policy and the need to do that very carefully. Um, and uh, as the chair mentioned, there is another amendment offered, which um, will speak to that. But uh, so my um, intention here is, is to act carefully, to not implement uh, procedures that will set up different systems in different neighboring communities. Um, but to come up with a well thought out and well uh, documented statewide system to finally address this thorny problem. So thank you. The I will question, be speaking, voting against the amendment, obviously. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others member from Burlington? Madam Speaker, I have a point of inquiry. Um, when there's a, um, an amendment on the floor and it pertains to policy in a committee, is it in order to interrogate the chair of a committee to learn more about the committee's work on the issue that is the subject of the amendment? Uh, member, you can ask to interrogate um, a member uh, if they so choose. Okay. I know that that's like the floor, so um, I'll, I'll try. So let's, um, let me ask uh, maybe the, if the chair of Go government operations would consent to, to me asking one question, I would like to ask it. The member from St. Albans City is interrogated if he so chooses. 
Oh, okay. I, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and anyone could answer this question, uh, Madam Speaker, but I thought it might be appropriate to ask the Chair of, of Government Operations, because it is related to the charter changes that are referenced that um, relate to the matter at hand. Um, the question I have is, why was it okay for the charter change to pass in the, in the past, but not now? Like what additional information or factors, have, what, what's come up that's changed the, the, um, the sort of political or economic or social landscape that it was okay to do it in a past biennium, but not this one? Madam Speaker, I'm not sure how appropriate it would be to go into an entire uh, span of political conversation about four years worth of hemming and hawing and weighing and conversations, votes that were taken um, about a bill that was in a previous biennium. And every biennium, we start our work anew. Um, and we are a Dillon's Rule state. We're a state that constitutionally, every single municipality, the powers that that municipality has are granted to it through charters by uh, the state of Vermont. So any power that a municipality wants that it isn't granted in a charter or in general law, they have to come through this process. Um, and there's a powerful argument that direct democracy means that we should give deference to those charters. And we often do, but it does not mean that we're obligated necessarily to pass every policy, especially when it will inevitably have ramifications on markets outside of the bounds of the communities that pass that particular policy. Um, Madam Speaker, um, I appreciate the, that, that the question I asked was quite broad. So I'm gonna ask one more specific one and then I'll let it go. I'm curious, like what, if, if, if we could hear just a, a brief summary of the harm that would be caused by taking this action. Because I'm not sure I've heard that articulated yet in this debate clearly. And, and if, if, the member, um, uh, if the member of the committee doesn't want to answer, anyone in the body is welcome to answer that question. Madam Speaker, I believe the member is asking what harm would be caused by passing the amendment that's before us, a, a no-cause moratorium. Am I understanding that question correctly? Yeah, and, and that, I don't know. Yeah, yes, and it might be more appropriate for another person to answer that now that I'm thinking about it because it's not specific to a charter change, but to housing policy. I believe I am not the member to answer that <laughs> <Yeah>. question. <laughs> so I'll just leave it out there, and if anyone wants to speak to that now or later, off the floor, I'd, I'd welcome uh, the conversation. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others? Member from Rutland City. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, before I, I started to serve in this body, uh, when I previously served on the Rutland City Board of Aldermen, uh, the voters of Rutland City passed three different charter changes, all by a significant uh, portion of the vote. I believe they were all around 70% in favor. Sent those three charter changes up here and they did not pass out of this body, and they, those char changes uh, remain unmade to the city of Rutland Charter. People in my community were very frustrated with that. They, they were upset. So I understand the dissatisfaction in the communities that have passed charter changes and have not seen uh, the changes take place. However, I have never once advocated for a charter change coming out of my community to become state law. Uh, our municipalities are different. We have different challenges. As a representative of the city of Rutland, I would have real concerns with a charter change for the city of Burlington being applied cookie cutter fashion to my community and the rest of this state. Uh, this has not been vetted as a statewide vehicle. This has not gone through the committee process the way it needs to be. And as a community, as a representative of a community that shares some of Burlington's problems, but also has some very different challenges, I would be very worried about unintended consequences of quickly and without the proper research passing this amendment. 
I'm worried about what that would do on the ground in my community. I worry that it could quite possibly make our challenges worse. So while I have sympathy to the people of Burlington and the other communities that have passed these charter changes, in concern for unintended consequences in my community, I will be voting no on this amendment. And I would encourage every member of this body whose community has not passed a similar charter change to do the same. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others, member from Burlington? Madam Speaker, we've had a lot of amendments on the floor in the last week or so. And so upon review of uh, the video of the uh, March 13th and 14th committee discussion on this bill, um, I listened for whether or not this issue was raised and it was not. And so for that reason, I, I would have hoped that the sponsor of the amendment would have raised this in committee when the bill was there. I'll be voting no, thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others, member from Winooski? Madam Speaker, may I have permission to speak a third time? It's your amendment, so oh, you thank don't goodness. need permission. Oh, sorry to everyone else. Um, Madam Speaker, I do just wanna highlight that I think what the sponsors of this amendment are, are really getting at is that our communities, yes, have been asking for action on this and that statewide action is needed. When I talk to the people of Winooski, they don't just want renters protections for the people of Winooski. That is just all they have control over. That is what they were able to put on the ballot. That is what they were able to enact for the people of Winooski. What we would like to see are protections across the board for renters in not having this opportunity for no cause evictions. I do just want to underscore that this is not a new policy for the state of Vermont. It has already been enacted. It was retracted following the pandemic. And what we saw in response to that was an uptick of three times the number of no cause evictions that happened in this state. Those are people that are getting destabilized. Those are people putting being put out onto the street, and those are people that are exacerbating our already overrun motel hotel program. Um, I, I don't want to imply that uh, members have impugned motives in this discussion, but uh, I have been very adamant, Madam Speaker, in my time this past two years and in my four years here about the need for eviction protections, both in committee, with you, and with other committees. And I do ask the body to please support this amendment in the protection of those who are more vulnerable. I don't want to focus on the fact that there are landowners who are landlords who have power over who has housing and who does not. Our body is to protect those who are in the most marginalized positions and ensure that their rights are protected and that they are able to stay in permanent housing. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others member from Halifax? Madam Speaker, COVID era evictions that led to inflated rents in my district have been gut wrenching. Um, but since this is being put out as a statewide issue, it's relevant to share that in my district, due to increased demand, new units have also come online. Um, and responsible landlords are asking me for a thorough and balanced discussion of this issue that will help them do just that. Uh, with deeply mixed feelings and appreciation for uh, the member's amendment, I will be voting with the committee on this. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others? Are you ready for the question? Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, just for the record, I want to say that my, my, we're, not, we're not supposed to talk about others' intent, but we can talk about our own. My intent is never to impose my will on someone, but to convince people of a better way. And I guess I question, what's, what is the difference between advocating for statewide application of a policy that was generated through direct, direct democracy of our constituents and advocating for statewide policy coming from the people who fund political parties? There's a big difference. And I think until this body is majority 
tenants and not majority landlords, we're just going to keep hitting these kind of barriers. So this is an invitation to the people of Vermont. Go out and read your city charters and organize. Get the petitions, get the items on the ballot, organize with people across this state, across town lines. This is, this is the only way we ever have made change in history is when, is when the people stand up, they use their voices, they use our democracy, and it might take a long time, but we'll get there. But I don't want people to feel discouraged where they do all this hard work and then a small group of people put barriers in the, in, in the way. Don't give up, keep organizing, and remember that, you know, until you're represented, your interests are not going to be represented. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others, member from Burlington? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I um, thank the committee for consideration of uh, the amendment on which I was a co-sponsor. Um, I appreciate other amendments that have been offered for today, and I look forward to the body getting more fully educated on the issue of just cause eviction. Uh, just cause eviction was first passed as a statewide policy in 1974 in New Jersey, has since been passed in multiple other states, and tens of millions of Americans across the country have protection of just cause eviction. Um, just cause eviction says that landlords may evict tenants when they don't pay their rent, when they violate their lease terms, when they're, for example, when they're violent or commit a crime on the property. Um, it allows landlords to evict tenants when they plan to sell a property. Uh, what it doesn't do is allow landlords to evict tenants when they don't like their tenant. Um, or when they want to remodel the unit and uh, charge twice the rent, as happens in my district. Um, uh, hearing about it on Facebook quite regularly right now in my district, actually. Uh, it's a really important step for us to take as a state. Uh, obviously, our charter changes being passed would help Burlington. Um, but if we can't get that done, it's still a reasonable policy for us to consider as a state. Um, it's already something that federal low-income housing tax credit receiving um, building uh, pro uh, housing providers must do in our state, across the entire state, but private landlords aren't required to do so. Um, as we know, we have a affordable housing crisis and a, a crisis of homelessness in our state. One of the leading causes for a difficulty in being rehoused when someone is homeless is whether or not they have a prior eviction. Um, what we know from other states who have implemented just cause eviction policies is that they reduce the rate of homelessness by about 11% because it's easier for people who are homeless uh, to be housed um, if they never have to be evicted. We can, we're, we're working on this in other ways. You know, we're providing more funding for uh, rental arrears. We're uh, working on programs to help landlords get funding to repair units that have been damaged by tenants while they're still there. We need to keep people housed. Uh, we need to lower the eviction rate in our state. That will lower the rate of homelessness in our state um, while we provide adequate emergency shelter and then build our way out of the problem in the next 10 years. I do appreciate your consideration for this amendment and um, look forward to continuing the conversation. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Winooski and others? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please stand. You, done. you may be seated. And all those opposed, please rise.
Members, you may be seated. Members, please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 13. Those voting no, 119. The nays have it, and you have declined to amend the bill. Now the member from Barrytown, Representative McFawn, offers an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Barrytown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a very simple amendment. It proposes to take $1.5 million from the appropriation to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board for the purpose of implementing the housing and residential services pilot programs for individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Why do we want to do this? Madam Speaker, three years ago, this House passed legislation to plan and implement three pilot housing programs dealing with ways to house developmentally and intellectually disabled individuals when their parents or guardians could no longer provide the services they need to live the best life they can. Those projects and now they have been selected. What we didn't do is provide the money to support these projects. That's what this amendment's all about, providing the money so that those projects can move forward. I wanna thank the uh, committees on housing in general and the appropriations committee for listening to the testimony my testimony last week and others. And through that testimony, I was convinced that the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board will in fact fund these programs when they're ready to go. So with that commitment, I'd like to take leave of the House to withdraw my amendment. Absent objection, leave is granted. Now the member from Burlington, Representative Bloomley, and others offer an amendment to the bill that the first assistant clerk emailed to members at 1256 today. This amendment is also posted on the House Overview webpage, and paper copies are available at the main table. Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> I represent the south end of Burlington a city that several years ago passed charter change that significantly limited evicting tenants for no cause. Since then, three additional communities, Essex Town, Winooski, and Montpelier have passed charter changes <clears throat> that would limit evictions for no cause. And as some may remember, Burlington's charter change was passed by the General Assembly, but vetoed by the governor in the last biennium, <clears throat> which this body failed to override by a single vote. <clears throat> I and many in this body were deeply disappointed. H829 does, already does much to support tenants who face eviction. This amendment, sponsored by legislators from communities that have already passed charter changes related to no cause eviction, goes a step further. It offers a way forward for discussions about no cause eviction and eviction and its relationship to homelessness. The housing investments in H829 will be less successful if we fail to reduce homelessness. The amendment proposes a process of up to 12 meetings that engages those who play a role in or involved in the eviction process, tenant advocates, the judiciary, 
landlords, and six members of the General Assembly in understanding emerging eviction trends and data and exploring whether we can find common ground on an issue that is politically difficult and about which we often do not talk but reflexively debate. Most of us are sensitive to the challenges faced by landlords in evicting tenants whose actions endanger property or other tenants. The situation at Decker Towers in my own district is a very public example of that. <clears throat> This is why we have included members of the Landlord Association and Judiciary in the working group and members of the General Assembly who represent different political parties. <laughs> but we're on track this year to evict 2,100 households. No cause evictions constituting about 25% of them. In statute, <clears throat> tenants may be evicted for non-payment of rent, breach of rental agreement, including criminal activity, illegal activity, or acts of violence, or for no cause. <clears throat> and it's time for us to have the conversation we need to have. <clears throat> Moving to the provisions of this amendment. As noted, the amendment creates an eviction study committee to review the causes of eviction and propose legislation that advances eviction laws that are responsive to the crises of housing and homelessness. The committee <clears throat> will be composed of 10 members who will meet up to 12 times. Three current members of the House, not all of the same political party. Three current members of the Senate, not all of the same political party, a representative of Vermont Legal Aid, a representative of the Vermont Landlords Association, a representative of the Community Action Partnership, a representative of the judiciary. <laughs> the committee will assess Vermont's existing evictions process, including the current statutory bases for eviction, data related to the bases on which landlords and mobile home park owners rely when terminating tenancies, their regularly, regularity and proportion, the procedures used by landlords and mobile home, sorry, mobile home park owners to terminate a tenancy, including those processes used before, during, and after eviction proceedings commence and when they are resolved by the court. The procedures used by tenants to defend themselves in eviction proceedings, whether there are inconsistencies in enforcing or administering evictions laws across Vermont, <clears throat> the effects of existing evictions and landlord tenant laws on rates of homelessness in Vermont. And the committee will also be charged with reviewing models for eviction laws <clears throat> and other changes that can respond to Vermont's crises of housing and homelessness. We, one of the things that motivated this amendment is the fact that we do not have very good data on evictions. And a lot of it is collected by legal aid, who ha which has to go in file by file because of the way in which records are kept by the court. Data collection is critical if we're to make our decisions about landlord-tenant relationships um, <clears throat> that are informed by what is actually happening in the field. The committee's work will be supported by the offices of legislative operations and council. Its first meeting will be called by the ranking member of the Senate by August 31st, 2024. As I said, the amendment <clears throat> authorizes up to 12 meetings, after which it will prevent it, present its findings and any recommendations for legislative action which could be in the form of proposed legislation in a report on or before December 15th. <clears throat> the amendment carries a small appropriation to support per diems for legislative committee members at totaling, if there are up to tw are there 12 meetings, um, $17,000, which would be funded through carry forward from the legislative budget. <clears throat> I hope you will support this amendment by voting yes. Thank you. Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Burlington for presenting the amendment this morning in committee. Um, your general and housing committee supported this amendment by a vote of 10-02, and we ask for the body's support. 
The question is, mem oh, member from Middlebury. Madam Speaker, the House Appropriations Committee also uh, appreciated the opportunity to review this amendment, uh, and we thank the member from Burlington. There are per diems in the amendment for the working group. The estimated cost has been said is about $17,000, and it can be absorbed by the General Assembly budget as there is sufficient carry forward to cover the cost as needed. So there are no additional funds required for the working group. The House Appropriations Committee vote on this amendment was 8-4-0, and we hope you will support the committee by voting yes. Thank you. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington and others? Member from Winooski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise in support of the amendment and thank the, the member from Burlington and others for bringing it forward. Um, it's reassuring to know that there will be a substantive conversation to follow and that uh, we will have legislative language for this body to consider in the next biennium. I, I do want to offer a, a caution or perspective um, for you, Madam Speaker, in relation to the representation of um, state representatives and senators and recognizing that it is not just political parties that are most important here, but recognizing the lived experience of those who are renters themselves in this building and those who are landlords and making sure that there is balanced representation. Um, otherwise, I will be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Member from Burlington. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington and others, member from Clarendon? Madam Speaker, may I uh, interrogate the presenter of the amendment? The member from Burlington is interrogated. Madam Speaker, I'm wondering if um, you considered, you, you have a 10-member <laughs> panel here that's going to look at evictions, um, and I see only one person representing the landlords, uh, and, and, and the whole thing's talking about the landlord's property. Um, was there any discussion about including more members of the property owner group uh, in this committee? Uh, Madam Speaker, there was uh, n not in uh, this, this amendment I put forward um, and presented to um, two of the committees, um, House General and to um, uh, House Appropriations. And I, it, it is a question that came up in House Appropriations, and I think, uh, and at my reasoning in this particular representation was that judiciary, we have one <clears throat> organization, Vermont Legal Aid, that provides representation to people once they have received a notice. You do need... <clears throat> You do need somebody who actually works with tenants to help them avoid eviction, um, which is part of what we're trying to do. And <clears throat> the Landlord Association and the judiciary. Um, I So <clears throat> I'm not quite sure if I can say this on the floor. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Uh, it, I think it's a debatable point, um, and <clears throat> uh, <laughs> does the member need a, a brief recess? Well, I might. Yes. Can, may I have a brief recess, please? Thank you. The House will stand at ease for a moment. Will the House come to order and members kindly take their seats? <coughs> Will the House please come to order? Member from Burlington. 
Yes, I, <clears throat> I guess I am comfortable with this particular mix uh, for the reasons that there are some in this body <clears throat> um, who are themselves landlords. Um, there are, um, <clears throat> and we have, I guess, you, it, it feels to me like this is, um, this is balanced in a number of ways, particularly because we are um, ensuring that members of different political parties are represented. Okay, thank you, member. Um, I would just suggest that out of a 10 member panel, we have six legislators. I would rather see some landlords who actually are gonna be affected by this have more of a say than one out of 10. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington and others? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it and you have amended the bill. Members, please listen to the third reading of the bill. H829, an act relating to creating permanent upstream eviction protections and enhancing housing stability. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? Member from St. Johnsbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise to make a correction to comments I made on the floor the last time we were debating this bill on Thursday. Um, I had been looking at the fiscal facts book and made some calculations and discovered again that spreadsheets are a great way to make mistakes faster and with great precision. I uh, said at the time that uh, the taxes paid by, uh, by the wealthiest 1% were about $85,000 and uh, on average, and the average taxes paid by everyone else was only about $30,000 less than that, and that was, that was uh, a sum rather than average and uh, incorrect. So I, I looked at it again and discovered that actually the bottom uh, group, people earning $25,000 and less actually um, get money back. They don't actually pay taxes. So the averages are not really that useful. I, I could go on, but I won't. I'll just say that the, the greater point is that the uh, high income group, the top 1.1%, on average, uh, their average uh, adjusted gross income is a little greater than $1.3 million, which is uh, vastly more than the rest of us. It's about 1,400% uh, 4, higher than the uh, average of the taxpaying group between 25,000 and 500,000. Um, and it's also gr much greater than even the next group below them. So the point is that the concentration of wealth, um, even in Vermont, is dramatic. And the folks at the top end of the scale, um, even though we have a progressive system now, um, should be able to afford just a little more. Thank you. Member from St. Albans Town. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I ask that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll. The member from St. Albans Town requests that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll as the member sustained. The member is sustained. When the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, will the clerk please call the roll? Andrews of Westford. Yes. Two minutes.
Will the House come to order and members kindly take their seats? Will the House please come to order? I would like to remind members that we are in the middle of a roll call vote. Members and guests are prohibited from using computers, phones, or any type of electronic device. Please refrain from the passing of notes and conversation during the roll call. And when the clerk calls your name, please answer in a loud and clear voice so the clerk can accurately record your vote. The question is, shall the bill pass? Will the clerk please continue to call the roll? Andriana of Orwell. Anthony of Barry City. Arison of Wethersfield. Arsenault of Williston. Austin of Colchester. Bartholomew of Heartland. Yes. Bartley of Fairfax. Beck of St. Johnsbury. No. Rebecca of Winooski. Yes. Byrong of Virgins. Yes. Black of Essex. Yes. Bloomley of Burlington. Yes. Bongarts of Manchester. Boslin of Westminster. Yes. Boynton of Cambridge. No. Brady of Williston. No. Brannigan of Georgia. No. Brennan of Colchester. No. Brown of Richmond. Yes. Brownell of Pownell. Yes. Rumstead of Shelburne, Burdett of West Rutland, no. Burke of Brattleboro, yes. Burroughs of West Windsor, yes. Bust of Woodstock, yes. Campbell of St. Johnsbury, yes. Canfield of Fairhaven, no. Carpenter of Hyde Park, yes. Carol Bennington, yes. Casey Montpelier, yes. Chapin of East Montpelier, yes. Chase of Chester, yes. Chase of Colchester, Chestnut Tandrimon of Middletown Springs. Christy of Hartford. Yes. Tina of Burlington. Yes. Clifford of Rutland City. No. Coffee of Guilford. Yes. Cole of Hartford. Yes. Conlon of Cornwall. Yes. Corcoran of Bennington. No. Cordes of Lincoln. Yes. Damar of Venusburg. No. Demro of Corinth. Yes. Dickinson of St. Albans Town. Dodge of Essex, yes. Dolan of Essex Junction, yes. Dolan of Waitsfield, yes. Donahue of Northfield, no. Durfee of Shaftesbury, yes. Elder of Starksboro, no. Emmons of Springfield, yes. Farley's Rubio of Barnet, yes. Galfetti of Berrytown, no. Garifano of Essex, yes. Goldman of Rockingham, yes. thank you, Ghostland of Northfield, no. Graham of Williamstown. No. Granning of Jericho. Gregoire of Fairfield. No. Hango of Berkshire. No. Harrison of Chittenden. No. Hedrick of Burlington. Yes. Higley of Lowell. No. Holcomb of Norwich. Yes. Hooper of Randolph. Hooper of Burlington. Houghton of Essex Junction. Yes. Howard of Rutland City. Yes. Hyman of South Burlington. James of Manchester. Yes. Jerome of Brandon. Yes. Kornheiser of Brattleboro. Yes. Crescent of South Burlington. Yes. Labor of Morgan. Yes. Bounty of Linden. Yes. Lally of Shelburne. Yes. Lalone of South Burlington. Yes. Lamont of Morristown. Yes. I'm sorry, Lamont of Morristown. Yes. Thank you. Lanford of Virgins. Yes. La Russia Franklin. Yes. Love to Grand Isle. Lipsky of Stowe, no. Logan of Burlington, yes. Long of Newfane, yes. McGuire of Rutland City, no. Marcotte of Coventry, no. Mazlin of Thetford, yes. Matos of Milton, no. McCann of Montpelier, <coughs> McCarthy of St. Ahmed City, yes. McCoy of Pulteney, no. McFawn of Berrytown, McGill of Bridport. Yes. Mahali of Callis. Yes. Minier of South Burlington. Yes. Morgan of Milton. Morris of Springfield. Yes. Morrissey of Bennington. Rowicki of Putney. Yes. Nicole of Ludlow. Yes. Not of Rutland City. Yes. Noise of Wolcott. Yes. Nugent of South Burlington. Yes. O'Brien of Tunbridge. Yes. Odie of Burlington. Oliver of Sheldon, 
Page of Newport City. Paella of Londonderry. Parsons of Newberry. Pat of Worcester. Pearl of Danville. Peterson of Clarendon. Pouch of Hinesburg. Priestley of Radford. Quimby of Linden. Rachel of Burlington. Rice of Dorset. Roberts of Halifax. Yes. Sam is the Castleton. No. Sackowitz of Randolph. Shia Middlebury. Yes. Shaw of Pittsford. No. Sheldon of Middlebury. <laughs> Sibelia of Dover. No. Sims of Crassbury. Yes. Small of Winooski. Yes. Smith of Derby. No. Squirrel of Underhill. No. Stebbins of Burlington. Yes. Stevens of Waterbury. Yes. Stone of Burlington. Yes. Supernata Barnard, Taylor of Milton, Taylor of Colchester, Templeman of Brownington, Kalina of Bradbury, Tufa St. Albans Town, Toria Moore Town, Troyano of Stannard, Walker of Swanton, Waters Evans of Charlotte, White of Bethel, Women of Bennington, Williams of Berry City. Yes. Williams of Granby. No. Wood of Waterbury. Yes, yes, Andriano of Orwell. Anthony of Berry City. Harrison of Wethersfield. No. Granning of Jericho. Yes. Uber of Randolph. McCann of Montpelier. Morgan of Milton, Oliver of Sheldon, Parsons of Newberry, Pearl of Danville, Sackowitz of Randolph, Triana of Standard. For purpose of explanation, member from Middletown Springs. Madam Speaker, when you are in crisis, you need to act. This bill is action to move us out of crisis. Voting no is not a solution. Member from Newfane. Madam Speaker, lack of affordable housing is a top issue for Vermonters. This bill will make a real difference in Vermonters' lives while continuing to move us toward our housing goals. I voted to support H829 as Vermont's roadmap for continued strategic housing investment. Member from Pulteney. Madam Speaker, raising taxes and fees instead of funding these programs through our budget is something I cannot support. Increasing the property transfer tax as well as the personal income tax to support these programs is something I cannot support. My vote is no. Member from Bridport. Madam Speaker, I voted yes on this bill on this, the second day of Fair Housing Month, because we are in the midst of a housing crisis and the ill effects are far reaching. When we invest in struggling Vermonters, we all thrive. Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, I voted yes, as this will help facilitate equal access to timely justice and facilitate greater input from a diverse array of stakeholders. I look forward to this process and working closely with my colleagues and constituents to make this happen and reach consensus. Member from Waterbury. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we lament about not having a plan to help solve our homelessness crisis. This is the first bona fide bill that sets forth such a plan. I vote yes to bring some sanity to solving the homelessness and housing crisis. Member from Shelburne. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. I support a long-term housing vision to create the supportive and affordable housing Vermont needs. The costs to build the housing we need are estimated at 200 million a year for 10 years. As we finance this housing, we must continue to address the regulatory barriers that are the reason why smaller and affordable options, particularly for older Vermonters and for the one to two person households now the norm are in such short supply. Member from Morristown. 
Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Thank you. I voted yes in committee and on the floor for the Taylor Amendment. I also voted yes on this bill. We just voted yes for temporary supportive housing. Intersectionality exists. We cannot address the homelessness issue without taking proactive measures to keep people housed. This too is not it, but with housing as a priority, we have to start somewhere. Member from Waitsfield. Madam Speaker. I vote yes to address Member, comp Member oh, pardon um, me, do you wish to explain your vote? May I ask to explain my vote? You, you may. Thank you. I apologize. I vote yes to address comprehensively and over time our statewide housing shortage that will benefit and sustain the vitality of our communities. This bill also continues our commitment to, to provide much needed housing for our Vermont adults with developmental disabilities. Members, please, please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 97. Those voting no, 42. The ayes have it, and you have passed the bill. Up next is House Bill 874, which is an act relating to miscellaneous changes in education laws. The bill was introduced by the Committee on Education. The member from Williston, Representative Brady, will speak for the committee. In affecting the revenue of the state, the bill was referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, which recommends that the bill ought to pass. The member from St. Johnsbury, Representative Beck, will speak for that committee. And then carrying an appropriation, the bill was then referred to the Committee on Appropriations, which recommends that the bill ought to pass when amended as printed in today's calendar. The member from Callas, Representative Mahali, will speak for that committee. Please listen to the second reading of the bill. H 874, an act related to miscellaneous changes in education laws. Member from Williston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. H 874 can be found uh, through the legislative search function. This is a miscellaneous education bill with a few pieces and your House Education Committee is working to use the toolbox metaphor as many times as possible this session. So this is sort of a messy garage shelf um, in terms of toolboxes. I will speak to sections one through six and then pass to other members of the House Education Committee. Sections one through four perhaps act as a wrench. They are the enactment of the work of the Adult Education and Literacy Student Access Committee that was created through our budget last year in order to provide recommendations in a report to the Joint Fiscal Committee and the House and Senate Committees on Education on how to increase equity and access to adult education programs. Section one makes several changes to the adult education statute in Title 16, including in subsection A, the adult diploma program, we are amending the title from adult diploma program to become the adult education and secondary credential program, requiring Vermont residency for participation, lowering the age of eligibility from 20 years of age to 16 years of age, and requiring participants to not have received a high school diploma and not be enrolled in a public or approved independent school, post-secondary school, or home study program. In subsection B, the General Education Development Program, or GED program, requires Vermont residency for participation, requires participants to not have received a high school diploma and not be enrolled in a public or approved independent school, post-secondary school, or home study program, and adding a new subsection D that prohibits the diagnostic portion of the adult education and secondary credential program from being used to exclude individuals from the program or to condition payments. <clears throat> Section two of the bill repeals the high school completion program. Section three refers to the funding changes being made to reflect the sections I just referenced above, and the amendment from the House Committee on Appropriations will speak to more detail on this in a moment. Section four, this section strikes the high school completion program from the list of schools or programs students must be enrolled in in order to be eligible for dual enrollment to reflect the repeal of the high school completion program in section two above. This section also adds students enrolled in the adult diploma program to the eligibility list 
for participation in dual enrollment. Now moving to section five of the bill, perhaps a cordless drill or screwdriver in that it is an incredibly versatile and important tool. Uh, we are now, uh, we are staying within the flexible pathways subchapter of Title 16. Section five amends Act 67 of 2021, the Community Schools Act. Specifically, it removes the requirement that funding for the community schools grant program, which is a competitive grant program, is tied to the specific years of 2021, 22, and 23, and makes funding under this program possible in future years. I'm gonna speak briefly to the community schools model and the successes and potential for this very modest grant program. Community schools are not singular programs or a building. It's an approach to schooling and represents a fundamental rethinking of how to deliver public education. It aligns with Vermont's student-centered approach to learning and leverages our unique context and values. The pillars of Vermont community schools work, which are based in research and ongoing feedback from accountability partners at the University of Vermont, include one, integrated student supports to address out-of-school barriers to learning through partnerships and interagency collaboration. Two, expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities, including before school, after school, summer programs, and academic enrichment. Three, active family and community engagement, bringing students, families, and the communities into the school as partners in children's education and making the school a community hub. Four, collaborative leadership and practices that build a culture of professional learning, collective trust, and shared responsibility. And five, safe, inclusive, and equitable learning environments that foster a culture and climate where all students, families, and community members feel safe, healthy, and supported. We know from implementation science that full implementation of complex change can take five to 10 years with schools generally achieving partial implementation in the first three to four years of these efforts, which is why it's critical for us to carry through on the work we started in 2021. Perhaps many in this chamber read the reporting just last week in the New York Times about the explosion of absenteeism in schools across the country since COVID. In that regard, this small but important section of the bill is well-timed. This is urgent work in our schools. Madam Speaker, may I quote from one of the principals at a site during the, in the current pilot of community schools? You may. <clears throat> this principal said, I've never seen a grant that appreciated the importance of the connection between providing socially relevant and focused basic supports alongside with the things that we do all the time in school. You cannot do those things in a rural community with such a high level of poverty as we have without providing basic supports like transportation, clothing, and food, things that make it possible for students to be fully present and engaged. I've never seen a funding source that understands the connection between these things like the community schools program. This work in Vermont is being noticed nationally. <clears throat> One of the schools uh, has shared data indicating more than a 50% decrease in disciplinary incidents and principals from two of the current community school sites have been asked to coach community schools leaders in Kentucky on starting up uh, their programs in other rural contexts. Across all community schools sites currently, 3,500 pre-K to 12 students, their families and communities are being supported in this coherent coordination of state agencies and community resources that also allows us to better draw down federal funds. Section six, this section states the legislator's intent, legislature's intent to continue to fund the community schools grant program and provides the funding through the ed fund. Once again, this, the amendment from the House Committee on Appropriations will speak in more detail to this, but notably this money is already accounted for and not new funds. I now yield to the member from Burlington who will present sections seven and eight. The member from Williston yields to the member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, Section 7 amends the Flexible Pathways Statute, including making conforming amendments to reflect to the repeal of the high school completion program and the new name of the Adult Education and Secondary Credential Statute. This section also makes amendments requiring AOE guidance to school districts regarding career and post-secondary training opportunities to include information on all military-related options. 
Section 8, Planning Resources, adds a new section to the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, VSAC, chapter that requires VSAC to include all military-related options available for post-secondary planning and financial aid opportunities in all planning resources it produces. Madam Speaker, all options for financial aid should be made, be made available to students, particularly as military services affords robust opportunities. A great number of civic and business leaders have credited their time in the military, no matter how short or long, to their success. The military is a toolbox of its own, as military service provides steady income and benefits, including health and education, relevant vocational training that can be used after their time in service, leadership opportunities, lessons on discipline, a pathway to citizenship, and exposure to a world that is larger than just Vermont, so they can learn from that world and bring good ideas back to their home state. That's why I'm happy to support this bill and this section in particular. I will now yield to the member from Williston, who will continue to walk us through the tour of the toolbox that is this bill. The member from Burlington yields back to the member from Williston. Section nine of the bill includes legislative intent to continue to review the flexible pathways initiative that we've been hearing about throughout this bill. The flexible pathways initiative was created by act 77 of 2013 and encourages and supports the creativity of school districts as they develop and expand high quality educational experiences. Flexible pathways promote opportunities for Vermont students to achieve post-secondary readiness and increase the rates of post-secondary school completion and continuation in Vermont. There are several complex programs within this initiative, and this section of the bill is essentially a binding homework assignment for us to be continuing to look at this groundbreaking legislation over time. What is working well? What are we spending our education fund dollars on? What is the return on investment? And if warranted, how can we improve? I now yield to the member from St. Albans Town who will present sections 10 through 12. The member from Williston yields to the member from St. Albans Town. I will be presenting sections 10 through 12. Um, section 10 is a post-graduation career and settlement behaviors of students attending Vermont post-secondary institutions. And it's a report that will be um, require the Agency of Education, the Agency of Commerce, Community and Development, and the Department of Labor in consultation with Vermont's public and private post-secondary schools to submit a written report to the legislature on the post-graduation career and settlement behaviors of students attending Vermont colleges and universities. Because Madam Speaker, we are not just last in retention of our post-secondary graduates, we are dead last. Um, the report is due on or before July 1st, 2025. In section 11, it um, will amend 16 VSA 326, the Uniform Chart of Accounts. This section adds a section to the supervisory union chapter of Title 16 codifying the requirement that supervisory unions use a uniform chart of accounts to record and report all school finance data. This requirement currently exists in various pieces of session law and this section adds to the requirement to Title 16. In section 12 is just a repeal. This section repeals the various different pieces of session law um, that require the use of the uniform chart of accounts since section 11 of the bill codifies the requirement. I now uh, yield to the, back to the member from Williston. The member from St. Albans Town yields to the member from Williston. Finally, section 13, this act takes effect on July 1st of 2024. Your House Committee on Education heard from Legislative Council, the Office of Legislative Council, Division Director of Student Pathways at the Agency of Education, Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs at the Agency of Education, Principal Hazen Union School, Principal Virgen's Union Elementary School, Community School Coordinator from North Country Supervisory Union, the Principal at Cabot School, the Burrick Green and Gold Associate Professor of Education at the University of Vermont, Education Program Manager and State Director of Adult Education and Literacy at the Agency of Education, a representative from Action Circles, a member from the Adult Education and Literacy Network, the Executive Director of the Northeast Kingdom Learning Services, the Chair of the Adult Education and Literacy High School Completion Program Student Access Committee, the Executive Director of the Tutorial Center, Director of Programs for Vermont Adult Learning, 
Major General from the Vermont National Guard, the co-chairs of our National Guard and Veterans Affairs Caucus, and the representative from Burlington. And now speaking for the Committee on Ways and Means, member from St. Johnsbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. House Ways and Means had a, an opportunity to look at this bill um, and work, with it, work on it with JFO. JFO's estimate is that this would cost the general fund two and a half million dollars a year beginning in FY25 due to the expansion of eligibility for the adult, the, the adult diploma program. Um, in section two of the bill, uh, there is a uh, savings of $1.9 million to the education fund with the repeal of the high school completion program. And in section nine of the bill, there's an appropriation from the education fund to the agency of education in fiscal year 25 uh, for community schools funding. So the net for the education fund is there's, there's no impact on the education fund, two and a half million dollars on the, the uh, general fund. We heard from legislative council and we heard from JFO. The voting committee was 1002 and we encourage the body to support the bill. Thank you. And now speaking for the Committee on Appropriations, member from Callis. Madam Speaker, your Committee on Appropriations thanks the, fine, thanks the Education Committee and the Ways and Means Committee for their fine work. Um, we heard H-874 and we recommend that the bill ought to pass at, when amended <clears throat> Members can find the text of the amendment on page 3010 of today's calendar. I summarize the, I summarize the appropriation amendment as follows. The first instance of amendment is a textual correction reflecting the content of the bill, simply omitting a phrase in section A. The second instance of amendment provides that the adult education and literacy program will be funded 60% by the general fund and 40% by the education fund. The third instance of amendment changed the appropriation from the education fund for the community schools program referenced earlier, funded last year by federal funds from 1.9 million to 1 million from the education fund. The fourth instance of amendment is a typo correction, <clears throat> changing competition to completion. The fifth instance of amendment requires the Agency of Education in consultation with the Department of Mental Health to undertake an evaluation of the community schools program. The sixth instance of amendment requires that the report on post-graduation career behavior provided for in section 10 of the act, include a careful analysis of the Flexible Pathways Initiative, examining who participates in it. It includes a close look at the dual enrollment and the early college programs, focusing on student performance, participation, retention rates, and continuation into the workforce. The seventh instance of amendment simply provides that in preparing the report in section 10 of the act concerning postgraduate behaviors of secondary school students, the agency of education will provide administrative and technical support to the entities involved in the report. The vote in your appropriations committee, Madam Speaker, on this uh, bill as amended was 1110 and we ask for your support. Member from Williston. We appreciate the amendment from the House Committee on Appropriations and on a straw poll found it favorable by a vote of 10-1-1 and ask for the body's support. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as recommended by the Committee on Appropriations? Are you ready for the question? Member from Jericho. Uh, may I inquire of the member um, from the Appropriations Committee? The member from Callis is interrogated. In section 10 in your sixth um, area of amendment, 
where we're looking at um, reviewing the flexible pathway initiative. Is there any breakdown of the students who are participating? Any, um, is there any look into which students are participating in these programs compared to the students that aren't as we're comparing who is more successful? This is in section, Madam Chair, might I inquire which section again is being in referred to? In the sixth to? section of amendment in section, section 10. 10. Madam Chair, <clears throat> the, the report requested includes, it, it, there is no limitation on it, it's at a minimum, an analysis of the percentage of college, college students who stay in the same state in which the school they graduated from is located, and the information on the types of degrees most commonly attained um, from Vermont institutions and a discussion of the obstacles preventing graduates from staying in Vermont, including whether housing options factor into settlement decisions and a comprehensive plan to increase the percentage of Vermont graduates who plan to live and work in Vermont. Sorry, um, Madam Speaker, that's not the section that I'm referring to. I'm referring to the section where we're looking at the goals of the Flexible Pathways Initiative and it looks like there is a review of that that is requested. So this is the sixth section of amendment. Is that? And perhaps I'm misunderstanding, but we're looking at. It's the sixth instant of amendment, sixth Madam. In, yep post high school continuation into the workforce for students participating in dual enrollment and early college. So that's number five in there. It looks like we're looking at a study on how flexible, the flexible pathways initiative program is impacting student, um, student completion rates, high school completion rates. That's Unless correct. I'm misunderstanding that. And so my question is, are we looking at, are we breaking the, geogra the geographic, the students, uh, the, the student information that we're getting, are we looking at that by area of the state? Are we looking at that by income? Are we looking at that by any other student demographics other than how their, com what their completion looks like, completion rates look like? The, the agency may look at that, but it's not required. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as recommended by the Committee on Appropriations? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have amended the bill. Now the member from Hartford, Representative Christie, offers an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Hartford. Madam Speaker, uh, may I speak to the genesis of the amendment? May I speak to the genesis of the amendment? You may, and do you mind moving your microphone a little closer to you? May I speak to the genesis of the amendment? You may. Thank you. This speaks directly to hazing, harassment, and bullying in our schools. The history for this particular work for a number of us, but me in particular, uh, goes back to the 
U.S. Human Rights Commission report dated 1990, uh, at which time the agency, you know, found that we had a number of deficiencies in our programs regarding harassment in schools here in Vermont. I've been working on trying to bend that curve since that time. And historically, this culminated with this particular amendment to this particular vehicle, you know, being the miscellaneous ed bill. It is a complex question and problem. There are a number of us in this body who have personally experienced these issues, either in our families or directly uh, with our own children. And what is so difficult about this is it has not changed. If anything, it's getting worse. So that's what encouraged me to push for this particular amendment. I'd like to thank the Education Committee for taking the time uh, to listen to my amendment and the testimony. Having done this work professionally and spiritually for our 87,000 school children here in Vermont who are being underserved in this particular area, I understand people's concerns and issues around components of the amendment, but I also know from experience and real-time data that these situations exist. Uh, and at this particular point in time, because of the complexity, you know, of the work and the time that it's going to take to move this forward, even though it's been a pretty lengthy uh, process, uh, I am going to ask uh, the permission of the speaker for leave of the house to withdraw my amendment at this time, knowing full well that it will be coming back. And that is a promise. Absent objection, leave is granted. Members, now the member from Norwich, Representative Holcomb and others will offer an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Norwich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. May I explain the rationale for this amendment? You may. Um, I spent a lot of time at the transfer station uh, this weekend, and like many of my colleagues, and I'm sure you as well, we all heard a lot about the risk and the challenge that we're facing in public education. And the member from Williston described the miscellaneous ed bill as a toolbox, and perhaps my amendment was an effort to provide some duct tape in that box. Um, we know that we have an education crisis Many of the causes include things people have mentioned here, including cost shifting from the state budget to school budgets, a severe lack of scale just about anywhere you look, which is making it really hard to provide our children with the opportunities they deserve, but also a lack of rules about what we pay for with our public school dollars. 
One of the most effective ways to contain growth in our education spending is to get more of our children under fewer roofs in more robust schools. This goal is undermined every single time a district closes another public school and pays tuition to a growing list of out-of-state private schools and schools that do not comply with Vermont's public accommodations laws. This amendment requires districts that choose to close their public schools to designate other public schools to educate their children. You may remember that Vermont statute currently allows districts to designate up to three schools to serve as their public schools for the purpose of tuitioning. When a public school closes and a district pays tuition out of state or to a private school that does not meet a public purpose, as to be clear, our historical academies do, we are picking up the cost of paying for more schools. This year, it has been very frustrating to see our precious dollars siphoned off to even more schools, including, again, schools that do not comply with our public accommodation laws, and this is raising the cost to everybody. Some have said this risk is not a big deal, but just as a tiny O-ring brought down a big space shuttle, the risk posed by unregulated vouchers undercuts all efforts to rein in costs, and it has the potential to blow up our public education fund. It is a risk because it means our current policy with respect to quality and affordability is incoherent. Our new funding formula, combined with the status quo policy, is increasing the risk that we will totally lose control of cost, quality, and civil rights protections. Ask yourself this. How do we expect school districts to close and consolidate public schools if at the same time we are incentivizing closing public schools to pay vouchers to private schools anywhere in the world? How do we complain about the quality of public schools if Private schools to which our students go when we pay vouchers aren't required to meet the same standards, and there is no public performance data for those schools. How do we insist on weights in school district funding when tuition is not weighted? How do we ask for cuts in public schools, because that's where all of our cuts this year are going to come, when tuition can't be cut? So all cuts, again, have to be borne by public schools, and most predominantly our public rural elementary schools. What is the point of anti-discrimination statutes, such as the ones my colleague from Hartford just described, if they don't apply in some taxpayer-funded settings? My amendment was an essential stopgap patch to prevent us from losing control of cost and quality and civil rights before the body has a chance to build a robust solution. Again, the public education fund is becoming a leaky bucket that no revenue fire hose can fill. In other states that expanded vouchers, we saw those vouchers drove increases of education of up to 10 to 33 percent. Given our current high funding, our current high spending, and the impact on our property taxes, we cannot meet our constitutional obligation to our children and continue to expand this poorly regulated system. I want to thank the members of the House Committee of, on Education who heard this bill and engaged in conversation. The chair of the Education Committee asked for time to take more testimony before addressing the financial and civil rights risk posed by our current system. I appreciate his willingness to take that testimony. I am grateful to the committee for its commitment to move forward on the solutions my communities need to ensure our public education system inclusive of our academies, can be the engine of opportunity our children need at a price our communities can afford. So, Madam Speaker, with great respect, I would like the permission of the House to withdraw my amendment. Absent objection, leave is granted. So the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Jericho. Thank you, Madam Speaker. May I inquire of the member from St. Albans Town. The member from St. Albans Town is interrogated. Um, in section 11 of the bill, um, we ask um, for a uniform chart of accounts. Can you tell me what the purpose of that is? Um, I'm actually going to defer to the member from Cornwall. This the, question. the member from St. Albans Town yields to the member from Cornwall. Uh, thank you, member. The uh, uniform chart of accounts already exists and the requirement to participate in it of school districts already exists. Uh, the real purpose of this section is to take that requirement and move it from session law, the white books, into statute, the green books. 
Thank you. And do all schools that receive public tax dollars have to use a uniform chart of accounts? I'm going to answer, I don't think so. I think that it is only a requirement of public schools, uh, and, and I do not believe it is required of independent schools that receive public dollars. But I'm not 100% sure about that. If I could get an answer by third reading, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Dover. Madam Speaker, I also have questions on Section 11. The member from St. Albans Town is interrogated. Um, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, in Section 11, uh, A2, there's language here that was in uh, the original 